Welcome to the Healthy Skin Show with Jennifer Fugo, where we're flipping everything you've been told about your chronic skin issues upside down and connecting you with alternative solutions your dermatologist never told you about. Welcome back to episode number 147 of the Healthy Skin Show. In today's episode, I'm going to be covering a interesting yet controversial topic connecting rashes with breast implants. I say that this is controversial because we're still in the process of figuring out whether implants of any sort can really cause problems. And we know in some instances, various type of implants can. And there's a growing body of voices saying that, yes, breast implants could be causing an issue. Now, here's the thing for me. I do not like to have very emotionally driven or fear-driven conversations. So I had searched for a number of months to find someone who could have a very intelligent conversation who also has a great amount of experience in this particular area. And I realized I know the perfect person. He's actually been a guest on the show before. His name's Dr. Tony Yoon. You guys might remember him. So he's going to be on in a little bit. Before we dive into that conversation, I wanted to head into my mailbox and answer a listener's question. I thought you guys would appreciate this one. This is from Deanne. I have used over-the-counter topical steroids from the grocery store for more than 15 years, and no one ever told me that they could have a negative impact on my skin. They're not really strong, so I figured that they were fine. After I started looking into it, I realized that I probably shouldn't have been taking them for all of these years, so I stopped pretty much cold turkey, but my skin has gone totally nuts. It's very, very dry, red, and scaly, even in places that I never had eczema before. My doctor wants me to go back on a much stronger steroid, but I'm really worried. I have no idea what's going on and I am very miserable. Do you have any suggestions? Deanne, this is such a great question and I appreciate you for taking the time to write me and ask and also allowing me to share this with everyone here in the Healthy Skin Show community. The first thing I would tell you is that A lot of people are under the false impression that the topical steroids that they buy that might be a generic even found at the grocery store or at the pharmacy are so weak that it's okay to use them every day, maybe multiple times a day for an extended period of time because we assume because it's over the counter, it must be safe. Here's the thing, using any type of medication long term can have detrimental effects. And unfortunately, you are different than other people. So one person might have used the same exact cream for a long period of time and have no issues. Whereas for you, given your unique circumstances, your unique background, your unique genetics, everything may start to have issues with long term exposure to this medication. I have talked about the problems and troubles that may arise due to long-term topical steroid cream use here on the show. In fact, we have several interviews already published and more coming later this year that will address and talk to these exact issues. I will put the links to some of these shows that are currently published in the show notes for you to take a listen to. Now, here's the thing. I don't know whether what you're dealing with is simply an eczema flare. So yes, some people have eczema flares or rash flares that can go beyond where their rash always was. That's certainly possible. Equally here, given your history, you could potentially be dealing with something like topical steroid withdrawal, which is a completely different beast. And it's pretty serious. So you may want to have the conversation with your doctor about the concerns of long-term steroid exposure, but that said, your doctor may not be aware of what topical steroid withdrawal is to even have that conversation. So it would be best if you educate yourself about it first. And there's a really great resource for you to go check things out. It's called ITSAN. I-T-S-A-N dot org. ITSAN dot org is the organization that is dedicated to helping educate people about topical steroid withdrawal. 
And one of the other reasons why you really do need to educate yourself is that topical steroid withdrawal is not an official diagnosis. So there's no one to really point the finger at, no specific drug company or drug brand. And unfortunately, drug makers, I think, are still trying to sort through what needs to happen, whether it needs to be different labeling on education around the use of topical steroids. But either way, there can be a problem that some people can experience after using them for a certain period of time. And by the way, just as an aside, for those of you listening, you don't even have to be applying them to yourself. I have heard stories of people that were applying them to their kids. So it was just on their hands and they ended up with this. So it doesn't mean that you directly had to be using them. You may have been applying them and exposed to them and can also end up with this topical steroid withdrawal. That is an aside. My point here is that we need to educate ourselves. And as I said, I'm going to share some links in the show notes that may be very eye-opening to you, but I wouldn't rule out that it is equally possible that your particular rash has flared and gotten worse than it was before. And so that's going to be the differentiator. Are you dealing with a rash that has gotten worse or are you dealing with topical steroid withdrawal? Those are the two things you need to figure out because the way that you move forward with either of those is pretty different. If you've got a burning question that you would love to have answered on the show, head on over to HealthySkinShow.com, scroll down a tad, you'll see the blue microphone and you can leave your message or request there. We'll feature it on an upcoming episode so that you can get answers and dig deeper into your own case. I think it's time that we transition over to my interview with Dr. Tony Yoon. You guys might remember him from a previous episode here on the Healthy Skin Show. If not, if this is your first time ever hearing Dr. Yoon, let me introduce you to him. He is an awesome, awesome man, (laughs) and he's a good friend of mine. He's known as America's Holistic Beauty Doc. Dr. Anthony Yoon is a nationally recognized board-certified plastic surgeon, recognized as a leader in his his field. He is the author of the best-selling books, The Age Fix, a leading plastic surgeon reveals how to really look 10 years younger, and In Stitches, a memoir. His public television special, The Age Fix with Dr. Anthony Yoon, has been viewed by millions. And he's also the host of the popular podcast, The Holistic Plastic Surgery Show, which I have been on. His new book, Playing God, The Evolution of a Modern Surgeon, details his humorous, heartwarming, and often harrowing journey to become one of the leading plastic surgeons today. He is also an assistant professor of surgery at Oakland University, William Beaumont School of Medicine. All right, Dr. Yoon, thank you so much for being back. I really appreciate it. And I felt like you were the best person for me to talk to about this particular topic today. And in fact, you already kind of schooled me on it. I thought it was breast implant illness syndrome. And you're like, I don't really think it's a syndrome. So for those who are listening to this, who have considered getting breast implants or maybe have them and have heard through the grapevine or the webosphere that maybe your breast implants are causing a problem with your health, what exactly is breast implant illness? So good question. Breast implant illness is something that has been making more and more news over the last couple of years. And it is a constellation of symptoms that some women have, symptoms ranging from fatigue to muscle aches to rashes to joint pain to hair loss and many, many more that have been attributed to their breast implants. Now, if you were to have asked me as little as five years ago, whether there was an, any proof that breast implant illness exists, the answer is is that there actually really wasn't a whole lot. Um, at least that's what we plastic surgeons have told ourselves. Uh, so if you look at the actual plastic surgery scientific literature, there is very little information there to support the actual existence of breast implant illness, that women get sick from their breast implants. But... Over the last several years, uh, and if you really, really do look look heavily into the literature, there are some studies, especially recently, not in the plastic surgery literature, not the stuff that we plastic surgeons read, but in the rheumatologic literature showing mm. that there is a possible connection between breast implant illness and uh, silicone breast implants. 
And uh, there isn't a lot out there. Unfortunately, the studies are fairly small. Um, there was a recent study that basically it was a study that took a bunch of other studies and put them together, analyzed them together, and did find a higher risk of certain autoimmune diseases like Sjogren's syndrome uh, in women who have silicone breast implants versus women who don't. And so more and more now there is this, um, uh, this movement that is basically created by women who have had breast implants or who have them, who have these symptoms, and they're bringing it out into the forefront. And finally, plastic surgeons and the major plastic surgery societies have responded, and the FDA is also now responding as saying this is a real, real thing. Yeah, and I saw the notice on the FDA's website, which I was, I was, I was pleasantly surprised actually to see. I was like, wow, they're actually on top of this. <laughs> much, much quick, more quickly than I would have thought. But that said, you mentioned silicone breast implants, but I feel like aren't there different types like saline or something? So is it a specific type where you really have to worry or is it just all breast implants in general? So if you actually look at the studies, the studies all look pretty much at silicone breast implants. However, uh, and those are the studies that do appear to show a potential connection between silicone breast implants and those symptoms of breast implant illness. But if you actually look at patients and you talk to patients and you get their stories, there are a lot of women with saline breast implants who have the same type of issues. So I don't think that saline implants can um, protect you from breast implant illness. Uh, and unfortunately, it does appear that you can get it with both. Um, but there isn't the studies on, there aren't the studies on saline implants that are out there. It's just more anecdotal, you know, but I do think from what I've seen and the numbers I've seen and talked to other plastic surgeons and, uh, and reading these patient stories and talking to my patients, uh, it does appear to be, you know, whether it doesn't matter whether you have saline or silicone. Okay. And do they have to maybe have a leak in them in order to cause this issue? No, definitely not. So a lot of women who do have breast implant illness do have implants that are completely intact. So why is it if you've got an intact implant that you can create, that this can create these issues? Well, the outer part of the implant is made of silicone. It's a silicone rubber. Inside the silicone rubber implant is either saline or salt water uh, or is a silicone gel. Um, we don't know what it is that you react to. You know, most likely it's the fact that it's silicone that's inside your body that you're reacting to uh, because you shouldn't react to saline. I mean, it's just salt water. I mean, we put it in IVs millions of times a day and people do fine. Uh, so we think that there probably is something to do with the silicone um, outer shell. There are some people who hypothesize that maybe it's heavy metals and other substances that could be inside the shell as well as the internal gel. But no, you do not have to have a broken implant to have these mm. symptoms. And was there a reason why maybe silicone was the substance of choice to create that outer housing? Like, is that a normal thing for us to react to silicone? Is that well known? Yes, actually, yeah. So silicone is used in medical purposes in a lot of different things because as far as we know, it's as inert of a substance to our body as we you know, as we know of. Um, for example, there are silicone implants that are put inside hands. Um, there was, uh, you know, so if you've got, let's say, a bone of your hand that is removed because it had a fracture or it necrosed, then, uh, then there are implants that are basically made of silicone that are used. Uh, more and more often now, it's, you know, they're going more towards things like titanium and, and those types of things. And so the reason why silicone is used is the same thing as like titanium, is the body doesn't appear to react as aggressively to that as if you put something in mm. that was made of a different substance that the body could react very aggressively to. Interesting. Wow. So so theoretically, then, this might even be beyond breast implants. Like somebody who, say, had an implant of some other type that has silicone could also have Potentially. We don't know, but could potentially have an issue as well with the silicone if they never thought of it before. Yeah, there is actually a term um, called ASIA, A-S-I-A, and it's autoimmune disease stimulated by like adjuvants. Um, I'm blanking on the exact name, but basically what it is is that people who develop autoimmune symptoms uh, due to a foreign substance in their body. And uh, and silicone breast implants being the big one, I suppose you know people put in... Um, butt implants. I put in shin implants in people who are made of solid silicone. 
you know, those numbers, though, are fairly small. And when you compare those numbers to numbers of women with breast implants, you know, it's possible that there's risks with these other types of implants as well. But maybe we just aren't seeing the numbers because there just aren't enough people to create this kind of, mm. you know, this uh, this large movement. You know, when you've got millions of women with breast implants and you have tens of thousands of them or more joining these Facebook groups, I mean, you need to have those numbers, obviously, to get to get that. And I mean, I think what we have to keep in mind is that with any cosmetic treatment or any medical treatment at all, we have to understand bioindividuality and the fact that just because your neighbor has breast implants and feels great and looks great and had a great result and no issues with their health, it doesn't mean that's going to happen to you. There are even people talking about Botox and, and we do Botox. It's the most common cosmetic procedure in the world. Five million people have it done here in the, in the United States every year. Yet there are, are a number of people who believe that they have systemic and chronic symptoms, health issues, even due to injections of that. Mm. I don't see any of that in our literature. I've never had a patient with a with a issue like that that I know of. But, you know, I mean, these are things that we have to always you know, uh, pay attention to. Mm. And so you and I think it's important for people to know. So you both put in breast implants and you also remove them. And you do all sorts of different procedures. So this is something that you're actively, this is the your world. This is your wheelhouse, essentially. So do you have both women who come to you? I assume there's still women here now uh, that want to have breast implants done. Do they also have the concern that they could have a reaction? Or most women are usually not concerned about that? Uh, more and more people are becoming more aware of it. And I think that's the most important thing. And so all of my patients who I see now, that is something I bring up with them. Mm. And I tell them, look, we don't have the studies to give you um, definitive answers and percentages. Because people ask, you know, what's the chance that this is going to happen to me? And my answer is, I don't know. There are, there are two small studies that do show that if you do have a history of autoimmune disease, uh, one of the study looked at that. Another study looked at if you have a history of severe allergies, that you may be at higher, higher risk for breast implant illness, uh, but these are small studies. And so that is something that I do tell them, you know, hey, if you've got a history of autoimmune disease, you need to be aware of this. You know, mm -hmm. if you've got a history of severe allergies, you really need to be aware of this. And you really have to make sure that this is a decision that you feel is right for you because you may be at higher risk. And then you on the other side have women that have come to you that come to you that maybe have had them put in, maybe even not by you per se, and are like, look, I would like to have these removed. And are they, is the reason they tend to want to have them removed because they are having symptoms? It's both. Some people who are having symptoms and some people who are afraid. Okay. Um, you know what, what, I think the, the tough thing in my specialty and something that's been a, um, something that is a, um, something that we as plastic surgeons should be ashamed of is that there are still plastic surgeons out there and there have been a lot in the past where they have poo-pooed women's symptoms with this. Mm. Uh, for example, I had a patient who I actually did breast augmentation on about 10 years ago, went to a different plastic surgeon about a year ago in my um, region in the Metro Detroit area and said, hey, I had these breast implants put in 10 years ago um, and I think I'm having these types of symptoms. Uh, my hair is kind of getting thin and this and that. And she was there with her husband who was actually there for a consultation. And so she asked this plastic surgeon as an aside, like, hey, just, just wanted to bend your ear on this while we have you here. Uh, he is an older doctor and um, somebody who's been here for quite a while. And he, guess what he told her? He said, you need to see a psychiatrist <gasps> is what he told her. Really? That was his, oh. that was his response to her. And then a couple months later, she came to see me and she said, look, I've got this. And I saw this other plastic surgeon. And he said, I need to see a psychiatrist. And I, I mean, I was dumbfounded. I mean, appalled that somebody would have as a physician, right. I mean, mind you, would have that type of an attitude. Um, but this is also a doctor that I have heard from my patients that when a woman comes in thinking about breast implants, oftentimes he doesn't talk to the patient. He talks to her husband. It's ah. like, I mean... So this is, I mean, right. I, there's it, a pattern it, it, there. Sure. Yeah. It baffles me that somebody could be in this type of business with 90% of your patients are women and this is how you treat them. Yeah. That's not, that's not really right. But in your case, I know that you take a lot of time with patients. You listen to them and you really talk to them. It's one of the things I really appreciate about you as a person, but also the fact that we could have this conversation, which is, is, I would say to some degree, a bit still controversial. 
to mm-hmm. some like I didn't want to have some like oh my gosh it's gonna kill you it's gonna yeah. make you sick I don't think that that's really a practical conversation to have in this day and age I think people need to have information so they can start to either do some research on their own but ultimately you got to make the best decision for yourself in conjunction with your physician right so I assume when women come in and have these concerns you guys sit down and kind of hash this oh, yeah. out oh yeah and I think you know if you're thinking about breast implants and let's say you're listening to this podcast, the first thing you want to think about is, can I be happy in my life, completely happy, and not have breast implants? And if the answer is yes, then reconsider, because there are complications that can occur with breast implants. You know, I mean, when you look at breast implants, yes, the satisfaction rate is extremely high amongst people who have it done, like 97%, but there are definitely issues that can develop. You know, you, you will likely have multiple more operations throughout your lifetime. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, there are complications that can happen. And obviously, breast implant illness is something that you have to always keep in mind. If, however, let's say you're listening to this and you have breast implants and you say, well, geez, I've had breast implants for a few years and I love how I look. But yeah, I've started noticing that I've got these weird rashes or my hair is starting to fall out or I've got this weird pain. You know, the first thing you want to do is get a regular workup by your regular physician, because there are a lot of reasons, especially as women get older, uh, that their body changes. And I'm sure, you know, you've covered a lot of this stuff. You know, there are a lot of reasons you get rashes and people get rashes when they don't have breast implants. Um, But if you get to that point where you say, I am sick and we can't figure out what's going on with me and you have breast implants, then that's something to definitely look into. Unfortunately, there's no test for it. There's no blood test for it. There's no skin test. Really, the only test of whether you have breast implant illness is to take your breast implants out and see if you feel better. And that's a big step for a lot of women. So that's the challenge we have. I would love if we were to have some type of way we can test somebody and like, oh, it's positive. You've got breast implant illness. Unfortunately, there just isn't. And hopefully someday there will be. And can I ask you, with the patients who felt that they had a myriad of symptoms and that it might be connected to the breast implants, how long and actually even do they tend to feel a difference after surgery? And if so, is it immediate? Is it like months later, years later? Any thoughts on that? No, it actually can be quite immediate. So for example, I had a patient who came to see me. Um, She had had breast implants for many years. And um, she actually listened to one of my podcasts on breast implant illness. And she said, you know what? And initially she said, you know what, my breasts are bigger than I want them to be. I'm thinking of downsizing. And then we talked about it. Then she listened to my podcast, actually, after we talked initially about downsizing her. And she said, maybe I should just take them out. And as she started doing more research, she's like, oh, my gosh, I've got all of these symptoms. Mm -hmm. So I brought her to surgery. I took her implants out. I even removed the capsule, which is the scar tissue surrounding the implants. And within about two weeks, so she ended up having, there's a list online of like 40 different symptoms you know, of the ones that I mentioned and many others. And I think she ended up starting with like 30 of them. Within two weeks, she dropped down to having 10 of them left. And then about six weeks after that, virtually all of them were gone. Oh my gosh. And I mean, so this is something that quite often you hear very quickly that they come out and within days they feel much, much better. Wow. Um, but unfortunately, it's not everybody. And there are some small studies that have looked at removing breast implants and whether the symptoms get better if the studies do appear to show that if you have a um, diagnosis and a rip-roaring history of autoimmune disease, if, you're, if you've got lupus or rheumatoid arthritis and it's been going on for decades and you've had implants for decades, you take those implants out, most likely your symptoms are not going to improve or they're not going to resolve. You know, they don't have as great a chance, unfortunately. But if you have symptoms but not necessarily a diagnosis – and your breast implants are removed, anywhere from 50 to 75%, possibly more of them do do achieve resolution of their symptoms. That is super interesting. I mean, I guess the other thing too to consider is like, if you want to take the more conservative route, you could look at your symptoms from other perspectives and address those from stress management, making sure you're Mm -hmm. nutritionally replete, looking at gut health, looking at liver function, doing all of that stuff first. And then if you're like, I still can't, get these symptoms to alleviate, then you kind of like got into like, you know, you're kind of at like, all right, I guess I, (laughs) we can say this might be the case. It's one of those where if you said, well, I don't really want these anyway, then by all means, 
take them out. Right. But if you do, if you do want them, because yeah, you take implants out and it really changes the appearance significantly in most cases, you know, then yeah, in general, I encourage my patients try to make sure that there isn't something else going on because the last thing we want to do is take something that you may be very happy with that may contribute to a, a positive sense of self and self image, um, interfere with that and find that you still have symptoms because that wasn't the problem to right. begin with. Because not everybody with breast implants develops symptoms. You and, know, I don't think I think it's a small percentage in general that do. And and I know that you mentioned how rash is a symptom. And I'm thinking to myself, okay, well, is that ra a rash anywhere on the body? Is it just across the chest and the abdomen where the implants typically are? Or maybe if we had a silicone implant or some other device implanted someplace else. Like, do you have any thoughts on where that how the rash in general would present itself in general it's it's a patchy rash but there are no there's unfortunately it doesn't necessarily follow a pattern that everybody gets that's the issue with breast implant illness is that it is that's why we call it more of this constellation of symptoms because some people may have one and other people have another and that's the difficult thing and unfortunately there aren't studies large studies that will that have gotten that type of information for us, you know, saying, okay, you know, 90% of people have a rash, 70% have muscle aches. You know, if you have a rash, it's in this part of your body. There just aren't studies that I know of that have actually compiled that together. However, there are studies going on now, um, which I really applaud our plastic surgery societies. They're actually doing these studies now to try to get to the bottom of all of this. And, and all of this has been spurred by women who would not allow doctors like this doctor I mentioned earlier to, to blow off their symptoms and they got together and they rose up and they said, we're going to, we're going to create a movement here because if we don't do it, nobody else will. And, uh, and I admire them because, you know, this is information that needs to get out there. You know, and this is from a plastic surgeon and I do breast implants and I think the majority of women who have breast implants, they're happy with them, they're healthy, but that's not everybody. And, and people need to be educated and aware if they make this decision that there are potential consequences. And, and that is very true. That's why I thought you were the perfect person to talk to about this so that whoever is listening to this, no matter where you are, or say you know someone who has had breast implants um, and they are having issues with their health. This could be a great opportunity to share this show with them. That way they can begin to dig a little bit deeper on their own without necessarily feeling like there's some, this isn't life or death. I mean, I, that's that, that I think is an important point to make. It can feel very um, overwhelming sometimes when we start to dig into websites and research and you're like, oh my gosh, everything feels like an emergency. Um, but I do think it's critical that we have a conversation about this in a way that is, I don't know, measured to some degree, because I always get nervous when people say, this is the next big thing. And then everyone believes that that's what they have. And then we're taking very drastic measures, as you pointed out, that may or may not be necessary for you, because what is going on with one person may not be going on with someone else. Um, any final thoughts that you'd love to convey to anybody out there listening to this going, Oh my goodness, this sounds like yeah. me. Yeah. I mean, I think that the thing to keep in mind is that there are people out there who are saying breast, you know, breast implants are poison. You're putting poison in your body. And then there are people out there saying breast implants are 100% completely safe and breast implant illness is a farce. And like probably most things in life, the truth is probably somewhere in between. And if you are having these types of issues, definitely I encourage you to speak to a board certified plastic surgeon who will listen to you and who believes that breast implant illness is real. And if the surgeon does not and they, you know, dismiss your symptoms and they, they dismiss the diagnosis, then find somebody else uh, who will listen to you. Uh, and, uh, and, and if you need to take your implants out, be careful as far as, you know, surgery, because obviously th those are permanent consequences. So really take time weigh your options, talk to your physicians, do your research, uh, and in the end, do what you feel is best for you uh, because you know your body better than any of us. That is so true. That is so true. And I just want to thank you so much for coming on and talking about this. And for everybody listening, in the event that you haven't heard Dr. Yoon on the show, he's this is actually his third appearance. He um, has you. his own great website, dryoon.com, but he has a podcast as well. So you may find a lot of additional information over on his show that will also help 
you make a decision. It's called the Holistic Plastic Surgery Show. I've been a guest on there and we'll link up to that in the show notes as well as his website. He's over on Instagram. He's even on TikTok. I feel like you're like the funniest <laughs> doctor over on TikTok <laughs> um, and I've, Facebook. So you're everywhere. I dis- I've discovered that I have a sense of humor of a 14-year-old boy, I think, and that's why I've done well. <laughs> well, you, you do have a very good sense of humor and you are really funny, but oh, you're okay. also incredibly kind. And the one thing that I, I loved about you, when I met you initially, I was like, he's a plastic surgeon. I don't know. And then <laughs> I just talked to you and, and I, I just want people to understand that I don't just know you from this. We know each other in real life. Oh, yeah. And I deeply appreciated your care and your willingness to look deeper into what's going on in your respective field. And I don't, I think most of us just blow people off and saying, oh, well, they're just, they just do this. And and you don't, you are different. And that's why I feel like we've become such, you know, we're, we're really, we're good friends. And I also deeply respect everything that you do and love having you back on the show. So, um, so for everybody that's looking for more information, Dr. Yoon's website is an excellent resource and all of his social media and his podcast are an excellent resource for you to check out. So thank you so much for joining us again. Thank you, Jen. This is fun. Appreciate it. Frankly, I'm so glad that we could have a guest on the show to talk about this from, like I said, a non-fear-based perspective and really provide also that authority because he is literally in the OR. He's working with patients who are experiencing this. And I really appreciate Dr. Yoon's balanced approach. All of the resources for this show can be found in the show notes over at skinterrupt.com forward slash 147. There you can also leave any questions or comments so we can keep the conversation going. And if you know someone who has breast implants and has been struggling with a myriad of symptoms, including rashes, this would be a really great episode to share with them. That way, they could start to evaluate whether they think they are a candidate for this particular issue. And last but not least, you guys know I always ask, take a moment, please rate and review the show. It means a ton, not just to me, but people who are looking for answers. Then they know why they should take a listen. They should stop and tune in means a lot to me for every single one of you who've done it already. If you haven't, please head over to your podcast platform of choice. Don't forget while you're there to hit the subscribe button. That way the next episode lands on your mobile device. Thank you so much for tuning in and I look forward to seeing you in the next episode.